And our artist today is Kinley Gray. Kinley, um, I didn't actually prepare a biography of yourself, but I figure we're, we're going to be talking about yeah. you so we can, we can learn about where, where you're from, sure. what, what, uh, what has brought you to this point in being here in Brisbane at this point of, of your career, and we will also start with your favourite work in the Queensland Art Gallery collection. Yes, <laughs> which is literally a little outside the box because it's an outdoor sculpture, but I think maybe one of the reasons why I like it so much is because a lot of my work I do outside in the landscape and um, sort of temporary, like, sculptury, things like that. Um, but I just, I've always loved this, even, you know, before I ever thought I'd be an artist or anything like that, and I grew up in Warwick, um, so I moved to uh, Brisbane um, as an 18, 19 year old. Um, but I love this work so much because, and by the way, I didn't know that Robert Woodward made it until I researched it for this purpose. <laughs> but I, was, I loved how the water is so um, spatial. Um, and, you know, just it seems simple, but making these spheres out of water. Um, really sort of captured my imagination because in a way water is just like air but it's like a bit more tangible or controllable or like visible and because I consider air to be like this ultimate spatial kind of um, material or substance. Um, so treating water like that was really fascinating and I, my favourite part is catching little rainbows in the um, fountain on sunny days. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about your background, where you trained, sure. where, where you've kind of come from in a way. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I went to art school through QUT, um, which was very formative for me. Um, I was a terrible student. <laughs> it took me a long time to get through undergrad, but I think it served me well in the end because of that, you know, extended time. Um, How long ago was that? I graduated... In, I did honours in 2014. Right. A couple of years ago. Yeah. Yep. So I'm still an emerging artist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and as I mentioned, growing up in Warwick, I think that's really informed um, the sensibilities I carry into my work now um, with that sense of landscape and place that is, it is different to, you know, living in Brisbane and having your day to day in this urban environment, I think, is a lot different um, to you know, like you were talking about the level of the horizons in those works. Like, um, I feel like growing up, my horizon was low and there was lots and lots of sky. Whereas in Brisbane, it does definitely, especially the height of the buildings and everything like that, feels like the horizon is um, higher, for me, more limiting because I, you know, like the sky, but perhaps for ground dwellers, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talk to me about your your understanding of art and Australian art as, as a kid, as mm. growing up in Warwick? You know, mm. what, there's, there's a local really great regional gallery in Warwick. There is, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, which I never went to as a okay. child. Um, right, okay. <laughs> I used to hang in the, in the, li in the car park because the Library Art Gallery car park was behind the cinema. Uh -huh. So that was my experience of yeah. the art gallery there. No, but um, we occasionally had filled field trips to Brisbane and I remember coming to the Queensland Art Gallery as a small child but the only thing I really remember is that um, portrait of Albert Nemegira that was shown earlier. Oh wow. Yeah um, and the whales and the dinosaurs and the museum so I don't think I actually had a relationship with art at all until uh, probably until I became a moody teenager. Um, and then that sort of <laughs> uh, piqued my interest at that stage. Um, but I'd never really um, thought about art or con considered it um, anything other than boring until I you know, became a young adult and went to art school. So what prompted you to go to art school then? I, was, um, I wasn't really good at anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I did okay at art in high school. Um, and mainly I wanted to get out of Warwick and move away, and that was a reason my, mo my mum would have ex accepted going to uni. So I was like, well, I better go to uni. You don't need an OP to get into art. There you go. So I did land in it in, in a way, but um, perhaps I just wasn't really conscious of, you know, my interest in the field. Yeah. It was, it was the best thing I could have done. Yeah. Mm. 
And QUT's program is a very uh, conceptually driven mm. program. They, the QUT College, I mean, I, I work at Griffith University, Queensland College of Art, very studio-based program. One learns the basic fundamental kind of technical aspects of art making and, and it can be quite medium specific, the different areas, you know, paint, painting, mm. sculpture, printmaking, etc. But QUT is a very different kind of program. Can you talk about yeah. how you learnt about, you know, I mean... So did you learn Australian art history? Yeah, we did. Yeah. yeah, first year, first semester, Australian art history, um, which that really opened my eyes, I think. Um, and we learnt that parallel to kind of a more uh, general Western art history. I think it's key to point out that it's very European Western art histories, especially in the early days. And then when, you know, moving through modernism and into conceptual art, it was Americana, Americana, Americana. Um, so, it, yeah. That, that was kind of my first little um, push into the Australian art histories. And it was, like as we were discussing before, you know, there are so many stories um, through in, in Australian art history from various perspectives and there's lots of different narratives you can tell and it's really difficult to kind of weave it all together into some sort of um, cohesive tale because it isn't a cohesive tale at all. Um, and the art, of the times really reflected, you know, the politics of the time and life at the time, and I found that, that was really interesting. Um, yes. Mm. And then your own work in terms of the kind of your technical understanding of art making, I mean, let's maybe we should look at some of your images mm. here. Can you talk about this work? Yeah, love to. It's um, a landscape, these are images. It, definitely. Of, so. Yeah. This one was uh, at the end of last year out at the um, Anogra Reservoir, which is just at, um, near the Gap. If anyone's been there, it's a lovely place to go for a swim. Um, and the dam wall, which is where the work is, is actually heritage listed. So it was a pain in the butt to get permission <laughs> to put work there. And I found out the only reason it's heritage listed is because they don't want telephone towers on it. Well, fair enough. Okay. Anyway. Strategic. Mm. Um, so I think... Like what you were saying before, in terms of my training at QUT, being very, um, you know, non-discipline specific or whatever, you know, I haven't painted since I was in high school. Um, I don't think I've made a 2D work, you know, for six or seven years, except for video work, which is that count because duration's a dimension. Not really. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so th for this work, the landscape was, was um, completely crucial. Like I'd call it a site-specific work. Um, so these are two views, I guess, of it. Um, it's made of reflective mylar. I'm not sure how much detail people want. A reflective mylar, which is an incredibly light material. And when it's um, taut and not creased, it's like as pretty much as clearly reflective as a mirror. So I wanted to make a work that kind of, as, a, as opposed to putting something in an environment, which I have done, I'm not going to lie, I wanted something that the landscape around this work is just as important as the work itself and they influence each other and like together can make a complete picture. Is there a specific viewing viewpoint in which to see this work? That was actually um, something that I was really interested in navigating with you know um, potential audience members for this work. Um, I didn't tell anyone where to stand to see it and that was kind of the encouragement was to find your own place to see it from. Um, you know, it, this was presented with a few other um, works that were around the site um, in various places and there was a little mud map given. So it was just sort of like, here's where it is. I, I, I challenge you or encourage you to find different places that you can see it from. So, you know, you could be out on the water on a kayak and see it um, across the water surface on the wall or you could be hiking. You, there's a hike trail. You can go all the way around the dam. Mm. Um, so you really could see it from many different places. You could kind of even see it from the road. And so did you, it, this is, this is a, a happening in a way, isn't mm, it? It's an mm. ephemeral work. How, yeah. long, how long was it up for? It was up for a week. Um, it was supposed to only be up for three or four days, but I was only able to have access to the wall on Mondays. So it had to last a week, which I was really nervous about because the mylar, while it's, while it's durable, all of that flapping, um, I was worried the tail would break and, you know, the mylar, which is essentially a plastic, would be in the water, which is not ideal. But fortunately, that didn't happen. 
um, although it was vandalized, which, which was... How? Um, someone just, like, pulled it apart. So the stick part is made from, um, like, an aluminium composite ted tent pegs that clip into each other. And I had run, like, a safety cable up to hold it all together, and someone had just, like, pulled it apart and slapped it over. <laughs> anyway, Interaction. you can't trust people. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's fine. Does it have a title? Yes, Fortune. Right. So I guess what I was thinking about with that, with um, the tail sort of, you know, flaps in the air and it has this flow of, like, it's going with the air. It's kind of reminiscent of that water, that shine. Um, you know, it seems like things are all bouncing around and I, it was kind of, for me, getting at this idea of Fortune not in terms of like money, but it may be in terms of fate, mm. um, but not so, I guess, strict or predetermined in that way, but just like what is your lot in life? What's your lot now and how, how do you navigate that? You know, and just maybe a relationship with um, whether it is some kind of fate or whatever, but that relationship to time and life and things going around, on around you and in your life and um, that kind of feeling I, call, I think I called it an ode at the time. It was like uh, an ode to the state of things as they are. Do most of your works have this kind of very temporary quality yes. to them? Yep. Yeah. Yep. My favourite ingredients for work are light, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> so I can literally tell people it's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> can I borrow the yeah. clicker? Might be a good segue. Yeah, very nice. This is um, an exhibition that I had at Metro Arts in the City um, at the end of last year as well. This was on the same week as the other one. That was a busy week. Um, so this one was a, like an indoor installation this time, which I don't make a lot of, and I do find gallery spaces challenging. This one's called Horizon. I had this idea that I wanted to see all of the horizon at once. I've never been on the open ocean, which I believe would be possible out there, um, nor have I been to really flat land that extends heaps far, you know, without some sort of obstacle. So I needed to make my own horizon. And I thought it would also be, I had this urge to be able to be inside of it and step outside of it, because it's not possible to step outside of a horizon, right? Bec and that's another beautiful thing about the horizon, which is why it's been this driving factor of my practice for a couple of years, is that it's it, every horizon is only yours, because it, it's a direct relational thing, you know, um, it's always a fixed distance away from you. And when you move, so does your horizon. And I do encourage you when you go outside to look at the horizon, especially this afternoon at sunset, and have a look at that and be, geez, that's mine. No one else can see this exact horizon. And every time I move, so does the horizon. Like, and I just feel like that's such a remarkable thing to have personally, but also as a, a relationship to the, you know, cosmos more broadly and to everyone else. That's what I was trying to do with this work. So you can't so really tell. So light is bending around the space, yeah. basically. You can't tell from the pictures, but basically there was a light source um, that... A big theatre light. Like a it was actually a hunting light. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I needed more power than a theatre light. Okay. So it was um, actually the light itself um, was brighter than daylight, the amount of lumens in it. But I had some gels and stuff to make this gold Warm. quality. So it shot down the length of the gallery and I had four of these mirrors, which are from the 40s, um, antique sculpt edge mirrors. They're like dressing table mirrors. Yeah, they used to come on dresses. I'm sure you've all seen some before. Um, I chose them because my grandmother had one hanging in her house when I was a child. Um, and you can get them on Gumtree. <laughs> anyway, so there was four mirrors and the beam came and hit the first and then reflected to the second, to the third, to the fourth and then ended up on a, a blank gallery wall. So there was this like surrounding beam. There was a haze machine going to give that palpability to the light. But you could only actually see it on certain angles. So it wasn't like you had this, like, you know, magnificent golden beam through. It was um, really subtle and you could kind of, through walking through, the you dark. could catch, yeah. you know, the, the beam went from this super immaterial thing to all of a sudden very solid. Um, and then someone would pass through the beam at a prior point and it would vanish. So there was a lot of this sort of play with that unattainability of the horizon. Um, you know, that something can 
seem so real and then be gone, or something can be so real but be invisible. And that kind of um, idea that sometimes the harder you try and grasp at these um, things, the further away you get, you know, like trying to catch smoke in your hand. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. yeah. And so th the reason I'm making all this is basically to help my understanding of the landscape in which I live. Um, you know, we were talking, you were talking about those earlier painters trying to, uh, you know, coming to Australia and, and, and using their, you know, European training to try and get an understanding of the landscape. Um, I guess that's what I'm trying to do as well, although I'm not painting, uh, but using, uh, you know, these sort of spatial forms as expressions of perhaps an invisible landscape, or which maybe it's an emotive landscape, and rather than represent representation, yeah, using this as an expression, so it's all for the reason of trying to get some understanding or, you know, experience or a different experience of the world I live in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel like with your own upbringing that you have a very different understanding of of the landscape as opposed to, you know, now living in a city and... Yeah, I yeah, think so. ...that kind of working yeah. relationship with it? Perhaps, and maybe perhaps just to a sense of, of space in general. Um, all of it's quite hard to, I guess, articulate, but there are, there are still really specific emotive feelings that, like, you know, when I go back home to visit my parents or something on a crisp winter day and the clearness of the sky at home is so different to in Brisbane and all of a sudden I'll be transported back to primary school sports carnival and I'm seven and my feet are freezing and I'm running on a you know dusty sports oval not winning a race or something but you know that very specific I guess nostalgia mm -hmm. and that sort of thing um, yeah. So this, this is also a horizon line. It is, pff, yeah. They crop up a lot, uh -huh, don't they? Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, this was filmed on uh, Manjuraba, which is also known as Stradbroke Island. This is a still from a video, by the way, and the video goes for about 20 minutes and it's on a seamless loop, so there's not really a start and an end. So the idea is that it just sort of goes forever. And I didn't make this with the intention of it being a work, it was like a, a study of the horizon and of sunsets specifically. Um, and I was sort of just floating in the water and I had a little tiny camera and kind of just like trying to, like I was putting my feet in the sun and just like relaxing and bobbing and just kind of, you know, I was from my perspective, I'm like, I'm standing on the horizon. Kind of, you know, or, you know oh, like yeah. Yeah, just yeah. playing with perspective in my mind um, and playing with that foreground, background and having a jolly time. And then it later turned into a work, which I'm actually quite proud of, so that's good. Mm -hmm. But um, presenting rather than the one we saw earlier with the mirrors and stuff. So while that's me navigating this idea of the horizon, I'm also giving it to everyone else to try and navigate an experience too. This one is kind of more, I guess, a display of, of a study rather than um, you know, an experience for everyone to enjoy. Because it's a bit different watching it on a video than actually bobbing in the ocean yourself. But I suppose also in documenting that work and making a video about it, documenting that moment, you're fixing that horizon. You know, you're talking about this. Whenever you look into the dis you know, that horizon is only for you at that point. Well, mm. artists are able to fix that in a certain point in time too, That's true. aren't they? Yes. Yeah, and manipulate it too, mm. interestingly. Yeah. yeah, and I guess make something worthy of attention, mm. you know, which is... I guess at the uh, the root of any kind of making art, because what you're really doing is just framing something and saying, look at this, whatever that may be. Um, I'd like to think that a lot of the time I don't just say, look at this, but I want I want to say to people, feel this mm. or experience this and tell me what you think rather than trying to push my view on others. Mm. Mm. So within that lecture in terms of the history of Australian art, do you see any of those kind of concepts or approaches as applicable within your work? Do you see yourself as part of a continuum in terms of this very specific history? Um, not sure about that second part, but yeah. I was interested when you're talking about Ruskin and those ideas of um, tr nature's truths and the sublime and stuff. And so 
I've been influenced by concepts of the aesthetic sublime throughout my undergrad and things like that, but mainly through academic texts, texts for reading Kant and um, Leotard and, and, and those sort of, um, what's his name, Caspar David Friedrich? David Friedrich, Those yeah. paintings uh -huh. of have yeah. it, those yeah. figures on the cliffs and the ocean. That, um, but I really like those ideas you were talking about of, um, he said that the artist's job is to try and um, find these nature's truths. Yeah. And I found that very interesting, and I, f I find it interesting too, because I think I somewhat agree, but perhaps in a different way to how he meant it, um, especially because the truths that they were bringing about in this painting are very um, directly representative like, and very visible, like things you can see as a truth, or, uh, and then representing that through painting. I think I'm interested in truths that... Um, you can't actually represent or that maybe aren't visible, but you can express or you can approach through different means and like bringing out a, a truth of nature which may just be your truth or your experience and but you, you know using more expressive ways to achieve sublime effect. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think it necessarily has to. Um, I mean apprehension of vastness, what a great great mm. phrase. Mm. I think that is, has a lot to do with those feelings, like I said, when I go out home and I, all that sky and it's just like, you know, how can you ever apprehend the immensity of this, you know? Mm. Mm. Very tricky thing to do. Mm. Yeah. Have you gone home and do, do you make work back there? I always None of these think about are there. it. No. Yeah. I always think about it and it just doesn't happen. I once used some some sky. So my parents' place is between Warwick and Alra, if anyone's familiar. I did use some Alra sky once for a work, but yeah, not really. I think maybe it, it comes with me, but it doesn't maybe come out explicitly. Mm, interesting. Yeah. It's, and in terms of the second part of the question, how do you, where do you see your artistic progenitors you know, if they're not within that particular history of Australian art? Mm, well, I guess I, most of my sort of art influences are kind of the um, conceptual American artists. Um, I was saying you before, I love Nancy Holt and her work, Sun Tunnels, which is out in, is it in the middle of Arizona or something? Mm -hmm. If anyone's not familiar, they're these massive concrete um, tunnels. They look like underground pipes that they would use. Just sitting the, on the landscape, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but with holes drilled mm -hmm. in them. So mm -hmm. these little patches of sun come in. I don't know, I just think her work's remarkable. I'm a big fan of James Terrell and um, very fortunate to have our very own James Terrell in Brisbane now. We are. Right yeah. on the side of the wall. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Um, particularly his sky space works, which are the ones which are basically a roof with the hole cut out in them, if anyone's seen those. I think Canberra has one. There's one down in Tasmania as well. Mm. Um, and that I like that mediation of the sky through those works. Mm. And then, you know, he adds light and things like that as well. Um, yeah, but those, unfortunately, not many as Australian artists in a uh, historical context that I really relate to, but um, there's many local artists from um, Brisbane and surrounds and um, Australia these days that I really, whose practices I really love as well. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, I guess, when you, li you know, we're always trapped in the present moment, heavens, how can I see how this is playing out, you know, in a history? So perhaps all these artists... Uh, who I like now, who are emerging and up-and-coming artists, will p be a part of a history eventually, but I'm, I can't see it yet. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's impossible to see yet. Huh? Dang. <laughs> I just need some more mirrors. The I'm going to look around the corner to the future. Ah. <laughs> um, so you have given us a reading, which yes. is on everybody's recommended reading list, uh, by Bill Viola, and I thought this was a really interesting in terms of thinking about your practice. So can you talk a bit about this reading and maybe how it's been influential on you? Sure. Yeah, yeah I read this in undergrad and um, one of the things I like the most about it is A, it's just sort of writing from an artist who just kept journals and just wrote and sometimes wrote de deliberately for other audiences but just wrote and wrote and wrote. I was really um, attracted to a lot of Bill's work, he did lots of video works 
Um, and he talks about a work in there, uh, Hatsuyumi, which is essentially a video of him filming a big rock. Um, and you're like watching the rock, you're like, yeah, cool, rock, cool. And then suddenly people walk into the frame and you realize that they're in slow motion. And you're like, I didn't realize the rock was in slow motion until the people came in. And then, you know, so he's got these ideas about duration and like, what is slow motion to a rock? What's, what is time at all to a rock? Um, and this idea of duration and time being um, only really having it, any sort of sense or meaning when it's comparable to something, you know, everything's in reference. Um, and then later in his career, he did these amazing um, portraits which had like waterfalls in the gallery and then like projecting. Um, Has everybody seen any video works by Bill Viola? I can't mm. remember the name of it, I'm really sorry. Yeah. But um, projecting like these videos onto these gushing waterfalls and they're very affective mm. works. And I think, you know, one could discuss the sublime with mm -hmm. um, Bill's yeah, work. I think so. Absolutely. And I think he, um, in the summary on the final page, actually talks about experience, which you mentioned before. And it's a very nice summing up in that experience is the real, raw material, mm. the me medium with which I work. Mm. That's a very interesting characterization of medium by a contemporary artist where ideas of, you know, genre specific painting, printmaking, sculpture, whatever, can be um, compressed into very different kinds of, mm. of work and one can think of. Well, because, you know, any kind of genre or medium, it is, it's, all it is is mediating experience, right? That's what art does, mediates your experience. You can do that through a painting, but when, you, when you're doing it in a painting, the parameters of that work are very clear. It's the edge of the painting or the frame, or sometimes the exhibition it's in if there's a talented curator and they can extend the parameters of that work then to have conversations with other works in the gallery. But that, those parameters that work really limited and I like that um, Bill Viola really kind of expands this idea of where is the edge of art? Mm. Like, and I think that's really important for my practice and something I think about a lot in facilitating experiences because if you're talking about making art that is, its medium is experience, where's the start and finish of that experience, you know? And does it make sense to have a start and a finish or a linear view of experience? So um, that, and that, yeah, what he was getting at there, I was just like, at the time when we read it, I was like, whoa, my God, this dude, he knows. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're at time, but I think that's a perfect um, concept to end that discussion on. Will you all join me in thanking Kinley? Thanks very much.